Would you turn on your devices, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 24. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 24. Y'all going to pray with me today? Amen. Thank you. When you have that, if you are able to stand, would you please stand? The Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 24, beginning with verse 1, where these words are recorded. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women went with them. Certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the ground, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. This is the word of God. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, I want to try to say something about the power of resurrection. And uh, this is, of course, this is an Easter sermon. Uh, I need you to walk with me through it. Amen. The bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead is a well-established historical event. Each of the gospel traditions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, provide a written record of Jesus' life, his teachings, and his works. Matthew wrote for a Jewish audience, convincing his readers that Jesus is indeed the Christ of God. Being a descendant from the lineage of David, he is the promised Messiah. Luke wrote for the Gentiles, his audience, convincing his readers that the good news of the kingdom of God was a message of inclusion, that whoever, whosoever believes on his name receives salvation and that Jesus died for all of us. Mark wrote to the Romans emphasizing the power of Jesus through his miracles, his death, his burial, his resurrection. John wrote forth a Greek audience calling Jesus Logos and presenting seven signs and seven sayings that identify Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, as the Son of God. While each writer, being led of the Spirit, presents different details about Jesus' life for the benefit and blessing of their audience, they all conclude with the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, passionately presents the facts that point to the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul points out that it is our confession of faith as believers which secures salvation through grace, and that is based upon our belief that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. Can I put a pause in it right there to say this? That if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day, you might be a wonderful person. You might be religious and, you know, seriously religious. But if you don't believe that, according to Scripture, you are not saved. I tell all of my students, my Bible study participants, that the only thing that we cannot compromise is the gospel. He came, he died, and God raised him from the dead on the third day. Non-negotiable. Everything else we can talk about. Amen. Amen. Paul wrote 
And all the four Gospels confirm that Jesus was seen after his resurrection, displaying infallible proof that he was alive. He was seen eating fish and chips with his disciples, talking with them. He invited one to touch him to see that he was flesh and bone. And before his ascension, according to Paul, Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at one time. I don't know about you, but for me, there is no doubt about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The observance of the Lord Jesus being raised from the dead is a time of rejoicing. We call it Easter. Some people have problems with that, and I understand that. But whatever name we give it, the day celebrates the fact that by the power of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was raised from the dead. His resurrection was the Father's ultimate victory over sin and Satan. The resurrection is a one-time event in history. Romans 6.10 says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Jesus died once and was raised from the dead on that particular day. Nevertheless, the power of the resurrection is ongoing. Resurrection power is the power that even today is changing people's lives. And that power is what is available today. And for a few minutes this morning, I just want to talk about the resurrection power. Let's shift our attention for a moment to Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 and the A section. There the Apostle Paul says, and I quote, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, end quote. I want to use that phrase as a starting point to say something this morning to you about the power of resurrection. Notice in this phrase that Paul uses, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, that he wants to, he desires two things. First, he desires to know him and then the power that comes from his resurrection. To know him, referring to Jesus, is the key that unlocks the blessings that God has set aside for you and for me. Knowing him begins with an act of God in your life. We can know Jesus because God has revealed him to us. So for those of us who know him this morning, we, I want to tell you like Peter, like Jesus told Peter on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, when he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Y'all remember that? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, and he's saying to us today, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven. In order to know Jesus, in order to know him, he must be revealed to you by God. To know him requires more than just reading your Bible about him and studying about him in Sunday school, learning a few things about his life. It's more than intellectual acceptance that he was a real person and having a polished Christology. It's, not, it's more to that to knowing him than that. To know him means more than just consenting with other people who say they believe. There's more to knowing Jesus than just having a casual acquaintance, a brief brush with him on Sunday morning. There's more to knowing Jesus. It's more than a polite recognition that his name deserves respect. Knowing Jesus is far deeper than that. To know Jesus, the Holy Spirit has to move on your heart and convince you in your heart that God wants relationship with you. If you know him, it's because God has revealed him. And if there's some stirring in you that you ought to get to know him, you need to know that that's God working on you. God wants relationship with you. 
And somebody this morning can feel the spirit moving and you want to come to God, but there's a problem. There's something preventing you from relationship with God. And that something is unforgiven sin. The fact that we sin is a part of our human nature. It's a human condition, y'all. We all would stand guilty before God without Christ. You can't get rid of your sin no matter how hard you try. Nothing you do can prevent it. The only way to be totally forgiven of all your sin is by faith in the one who voluntarily took your sin and offers you his righteousness. And that one is Jesus. You got to get to know him. This is how you do it. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And you can enter into relationship with God. To know him is to bow before him and ask for forgiveness for being an unbeliever. And then ask him to take up permanent residence in your heart. No work required. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that is a gift of God, and it's not of work. Stop trying to be good enough. Y'all hear me? Stop. You can't be good enough. I can't be good enough. None of us can be good enough to be accepted by God. If God required of us to be good enough, nobody would make it. To know him is the first step. You've got to know him before you can experience the power of his resurrection. That's why Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Amen. The power of his resurrection. Power is no good if you don't use it. And some of you got power in your life that you're not using. You have, by the confession of your faith, divinely given power residing in you. It's like you got a driver's license and you got a Benz in the parking lot that's full of gas and you got the key and you taking the bus every day. You got power. It's like your energy bill is paid and your house is dark and the only thing you have to do is and you have chosen to walk around in the dark. There is power in you. Amen. Listen. Three things about this power, and then we're going to move through Passion Week. First of all, the power of the resurrection makes you completely acceptable to God. Completely. When you stand before God, when you know Christ, you got power, you have been cleansed, you can go to God anytime, anywhere, under any circumstance, no matter what you are going through, you have the power. Because of the power of the resurrection, you have been completely accepted by God. The resurrection is the receipt that shows the debt of your sin was paid in full. Everything that God the Father required of us 
to be reconciled to him was fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You and I were guilty of crimes against the kingdom of God, and the just punishment for that crime is death. The highest court in eternity demands justice, and the righteous judge must carry out his judgment. The penalty for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For God so loved you and I, With our sinful, low down, every time you say you wasn't going to do it, you did it again, self. With our unforgiving spirits, with our propensity to lie and deceive, God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. And we know he was dead because he was buried. And as evidence that God the Father was satisfied with the transaction, and when the legal matter was settled between you and God, then God raised Jesus from the dead. Knowing the power of the resurrection rescues you and reconciles you to God. It releases you from the bondage of religion. And it positions you to fulfill your divinely given purpose. Y'all. When you confess Christ, when you know him, when God revealed him to you and you received him, he picked you up. And he positioned you in the presence of the Father. Fully accepted. Amen. The second thing, the power of the resurrection gives you new life. New life. When you believe the old you was crucified with Christ. Buried with him. And raised from the dead with him. You were buried with him in baptism, and then you were raised to newness of life. It don't feel like it, does it? But it's there. Newness of life. The new life remains in you at your confession. It It never grows old. You grow old, but the life in you does not. It's the life that God intended for you to live, for you to have at all times. It's a life of power. It's the power to break chains that hold you down. It's the power to change your outlook on life. It's power that moves you with your permission into abundant life and joy in Jesus. It's power that picks you up when you fall and forgives your transgression. It's power is directed to you from God. It's yours because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You have no business living like a pauper. You've got no business living like a pauper. You've got no business allowing your life to pass without fulfilling your purpose. God has given you purpose and he has given you power. He has given you power. Y'all know Satan wants you to think that it's all over. He will manipulate you. He will cause you to eat food that's not healthy for your spirit. He will cause you to engage relationships that are no good for you. And his whole plan in his life is to kill, to steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy you because he knows that you are a dynamo. He knows that when you come to yourself and you allow God's power to work in your life, he knows that There is no stopping you in giving glory to his name. He's given you new life in your old body. You got new life. 
Use it. You've got power. Use it. In the name of Jesus, use it. If God has given you vision for your life, that's vision for your life. Pursue it wholeheartedly. Pursue it with all your might and don't let anybody turn you around. Nobody can stop the blessings that God has for you. You, Do you hear me? I don't know what it is. I don't know what your vision is, but I do know that if you are in the family of God, you have purpose. You have vision and you have the wherewithal to move toward fulfilling that vision. Don't you dare lay on your couch and die a pauper. New life. Thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God the Father's way of showing that there is life after this life. It's appointed unto man once to die. And then there is life after our resurrection. It's a new way of living in a new heaven and on a new earth, in a new cosmos, in a new resurrected body. It will be like the one Jesus had. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. When King Jesus established his kingdom and sets all things in order, We have to be dressed for the kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. We have to be changed by the power of the resurrection. The corruptible must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you right now. Amen. Giving you new life, giving you new power and preparing you for that which is to come. Knowing the power of his resurrection empowers us to live looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead is the culmination of the passion narrative. The week began on Palm Sunday, and I want you to walk with me through the week. We've already said something about that day, Palm Sunday. Jesus intentionally presented himself as Messiah, the king who would come into the city of Jerusalem riding on a coat. His action that day, as we said, fulfilled the prophecy. He is king. He is king who brought with him through his birth the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the kingdom of God is in your midst. On Palm Sunday, King Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a coat as the king who brings peace. But he came as a king to do king's business. On Monday, Passion Monday, Jesus went into the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. He purged the place that was designed by God the Father as a place of prayer for all people. But the religionists of his day and ours had turned God's house into a place of commerce, marketing their forms of religion and manipulating the masses who were looking for hope and help. Jesus upset the status quo and drove out the Sadducees who got rich off the ignorance of the people. On Passion Tuesday, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. As he gazed upon the holy city, he knew that God's people had rejected the way of the kingdom, the way of peace. Jesus foresaw the siege of Rome that would ultimately lead to the defeat of Jerusalem and the utter destruction of the temple of God. On Passion Wednesday, Jesus 
was in the Bethlehem. Jesus was in uh, uh, with, with his friends and Judas Iscariot plotted with the chief priests and the scribes on how to kill Jesus. They were glad and agreed with Judas and gave him some money so he promised to seek an opportunity to betray Jesus while he was away from the crowds. On Monday, Thursday, Jesus went to the upper room to observe Passover with his disciples. He washed their feet, gave them commandment to love one another. He spoke to them of his departure and promised the sending of the Holy Ghost. He predicted Peter's denial, instituted the Lord's Supper, and afterward he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he played, prayed and was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. He was arrested by the temple guard and brought before the high priest. On Good Friday, King Jesus stood in cosmic fashion, face to face with all the powers of the darkness of this world. Our King stood dressed in the power of love and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do battle on our behalf. He stood there majestically, having been tortured all night long. He stood there majestically, allowing all the authorities of this evil age to pour out all its wrath and rage and hatred on him. The forces of evil, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, embodied in the religious leader and their religion presented by the scribes and the Pharisees and the temple guards, and in the Roman Empire represented by Pilate and Herod Antipas and his men of war. On Good Friday, Jesus was condemned for crimes that he did not commit. He was scourged. He was mocked. And he was forced to carry the cross upon his naked back where they, and he marched to Golgotha, where they laid the beam on the ground. They stretched him wide and nailed his hands to the cross. They lifted him up and nailed his feet to the cross. Somebody made a sign that said in three languages, this here is the king of the Jews. Oh, my brothers and sisters, on Good Friday, our king died on the cross to pay for our sin debt. He died. For three hours he died. He died until the earth quaked in the city of Jerusalem. He died until somebody reported having seen their dead relatives walking the streets of Jerusalem. He died until the sun became dark at midday. He died until the veil in the temple was torn in two, exposing the most holy place for all men to see. He died on Calvary. He dropped his head in the locks of his shoulders, and there he died. He was pierced in the side with a soldier's spear that pierced his side and pierced his heart. He was taken down from the cross. His body was cleaned and wrapped in a linen shroud. He was laid in a tomb which belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. The tomb's opening was covered by a stone sealed with a seal guarded by soldiers who made sure that nobody would steal the body. Our king laid in the grave all Friday after sunset. Satan was satisfied that the Christ was dead. Rome went back to business as usual. 
The Pharisees thought it was over and prepared for their religious rituals. The Sadducees went home to count their Passover prophets and the disciples went off to finish the leftover Passover wine. Good Friday passed away. All Saturday passed away. Then Saturday night passed away. But early Sunday morning, the Bible says some of the women went to the tomb to prepare to bury our king. But when they got there, to their surprise, the stone had been rolled away. And there were two angels with a message for the angels. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I don't know about you today, but I'm so glad that I serve a living God. I'm so glad that I serve a risen Savior. Thank God for the resurrection. Through it, Jesus was vindicated and we were given the victory. We serve a risen Savior. We serve the life giver King. He's King above all kings. Jesus is King of a kingdom and not the founder of a religion. Everybody that has founded a religion has followers today, but their founder is still in the grave. The rooster is still in the grave. The prophet Muhammad is still in the grave. St. Francis of Assisi is still in the grave. Confucius is still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Moses is still in the grave. Joseph Smith Jr. is still in the grave. But hey, Jesus lives. He lives. He lives. I have no doubt this morning that Jesus lives. I found salvation in him 40 years ago. And I want you to know that in every way that I've mentioned today, God has shown his power in my life. I know that he's lived. But the question is, is he alive in you? Have you been saved? The power of resurrection is available today. Jesus died on the cross, rose again the third day to be your savior. If you receive him, he will save your soul today. He will save your soul today. On this Easter Sunday, 2020, while you still have life, the ability to use your limbs. If the Spirit of God has moved on your heart today to make a public confession that you receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, I want to invite you to do it right now. Please stand, everyone. Whatever you need from God, is in the hands of the risen Savior. Come today. Come today and receive the power of resurrection. Is that one here today? If you've been away and you realize that you've been away, and you want to recommit your life today, come on down, make some, some room down front. You can, you, can, you can safely space down front once you come. You want to make a recommitment to your life? 
if you want, if you want, you can stay where you are. But if you're not scared, just come on down. Somebody here today, you, you know the Holy Spirit has moved on your heart. You know he's tugging at your heart. While you can feel him moving, you need to move in obedience to that spirit. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Today is the day of salvation. We'll wait for you. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not asking you to join the church. That is not what this is about. As a matter of fact, unless you just just want to don't even join the church today but receive the salvation that God has to offer won't you bow your heads please God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Thank you for giving us life and for bringing us to this moment. We know that this moment was orchestrated by your spirit because it is you who work in us to will or desire to desire and to do according to your good purpose. And so, God, we know that we are here by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, for those who have been away from the church for a long time and who may be bowing their head right now in a prayer of restoration, a prayer for renewal, we ask that you would grant their prayers right now. If, if being away have taken away some of the zeal, we ask that you would restore that zeal right now. If what we have gone through over the past couple of years personally and as a community has weighed heavy on our spirit, God, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would lift that burden right now. If our faith has been challenged and the flame of our faith is flickering and almost out, God, we ask that you would rekindle that flame. God, as your people present themselves in your presence, in the privacy of their own hearts, we ask, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would hear and empower your people. For those who are here this morning, who don't know you in the pardoning of their sin, but may be too bashful or whatever reason to come forward, God, we thank you for them today. We ask that you would bless them and help them to understand the prayer that is required, that I am sorry for my sins. I haven't been what you have created me to be. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Thank you that my faith in his resurrection makes me right with you right now. Thank you, Father, for this day is my spiritual birthday. Thank you. Father, help me to find my divinely given purpose. Help me to discover what I was born to do in your name and then father i ask that you would empower me to be that help me to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ bless me as i turn my life over to you and i thank you right now for salvation god i ask that you would bless the union church family thank you for your favor on us Thank you for keeping us in the hollow of your hand. Thank you for meeting our every need. Thank you for protecting these people in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Father, this morning for those who so freely serve, those who serve publicly and those who serve behind closed doors. And now, God, we ask that you would grant us a special blessing as we prepare to leave here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen, amen. The choir has a song for us and then the benediction. Please be seated.